Hey, Couch Potatoes. I'm visual artist Sabrina Pearsall, and today I'm on the green couch. Raz, Ew. I'm back on the podcast. You, yes, kind of. Um, well, yeah, <laughs> just <laughs> long. I was back in town just long enough to tape, you know, today's interview, and then um, Aubrey and I left with the record label's newest associated act, Terabyte. We drove up to Oakland, and uh, that's where we're at now, right, Tara? Yes, we're in Oakland. We're actually um, staying at uh, my friend's house that I used to live in and just found out that uh, Lalin from the session actually lives in the room that I used to write music in. Um, so if anybody knows who the session is, that's pretty cool because I love the session. So shout out to the session. And Oakland is awesome. And we are here. Yay. And we're we're up here because Tara is playing a show at the DNA Lounge in San Francisco tonight. Um, the show starts at eight p.m. We have um, Fighter Jets, who are a local act. They're starting first. Then um, Paperman, who's from San Luis Obispo, and uh, a friend of mine that I met um, through a crew in San Luis Obispo. And then I am playing at ten p.m. And then after me is New Spell, and they're also a local act, and it's all synth pop and electronic centered uh, music. And it is going to be, I believe, $12 at the door, um, or you can also buy them um, on Eventbrite or the DNA Lounge website. You're so nice, because if that was me, I'd be like, yeah, I'm playing yeah. it. I'd be, I'm playing at 10. And there's some other dudes playing. I would be like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's some other dudes playing, but most what's most important is that y'all come see me. I play at ten. Uh, yeah, that's that's probably what I should have said. You're right. I'm too nice. <laughs> no, no, that's what that's that's what I like about you, and that's kind of <laughs> my New Year's it. resolution was to be more mean. It's not working out for me so far. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's good. <laughs> Don't be like me. Who do we got on the show today, Raz? Sabrina Pearsall. The painter. The painter. Yeah, she's uh, she's great. Uh, super funny. Uh, back really from, from my hood back east. Right, from your hood back east. We're from the same county. What county is that, Bill? <laughs> That's Fairfield County in Connecticut. Tonight's sponsor, Fairfield County. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hey, go Fairfield, Connecticut. Woo! <laughs> <laughs> I think that this is going to be a good interview. I think we're going to have a good time at the show tonight. Yeah. And then yeah. One of these days, Raz, you and me, we're going to get back to normal. We're going to put together a really good normal episode where you and I are both in the same room for both interview and intro we're gonna have a guest and there's gonna be music and there's gonna be a podcast a normal podcast i know like i, I it's it's weird not having you here and doing this over the phone because i'm just sitting here in the room talking to no one and we all know how that goes right bill <laughs> <laughs> i want to thank all of our dedicated listeners for your patience with me as I was out of town uh, dealing with my shit. And I also want to thank our patient, dedicated listeners for listening to Raz yell at them last week. It was pertinent mm -hmm. information. It was pertinent information. <laughs> 25 um, minutes of you really grind my gears. Yeah. I, I, I suppose that classifies as a screed. So, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I bumped up my gripe to a screed, but I got out of my system. I mean, it was just kind of bugging me, you know. That's fair, though. And you weren't and around. It's the, it's, the, it's the philosophy we follow in trying to work with artists, and it's, you know, it's why Aubrey and I are in the field today exactly. with Tara. Exactly. Exactly. 
And for those who have so thankful to have you guys with me too. It's so great to have other people helping with this project because I'm kind of tired of doing it by myself and tired of driving by myself and all that. So this is pretty special for me. <laughs> there you go. Being nice again. It, too nice. <laughs> too nice. <laughs> you just said, I'm worth it. Screw all you people. Yeah. yeah. Not when it comes to money though. That's, that's different. I need my money. <laughs> Give me my money. We all need our money. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'll be like my grandmother. This is costing a lot of money calling long distance. (laughs) (laughs) So you guys have a great time for those who haven't seen Terabyte live. She's great. Big fan. I'm glad she's part of our team. I'm sure Bill will be, you'll be posting on social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aubrey, Tara and I are all up here together. And so uh, anybody in the Bay area swing by San Fran tonight to the DNA lounge to, you know, talk to the ASR crew and to catch the dope scent by terabyte, which is going to feature a couple of new songs. It, it's going to be a good time. And uh, podcasts ahead are going to be dope and the future is bright. My sir. Yes. We'll write the ship. We'll write the ship. So what I'm going to do is uh, before we go into our interview with Sabrina, We'll play a little bit of Terabyte just to get you guys in the mood. And then check our Instagram. Yeah. Terabyte, what's your Instagram? My Instagram is at the, T-H-E-E, Shakespearean, the Terabyte, just as it's spelled T-E-R-A-B-Y-T-E, at the Terabyte. That is my handle on all social media. Check Tara's Instagram tonight and you'll see some of her stuff. Check our Instagram and you'll see you'll see some of Tara live. And then I promise, as Bill said, next week we'll be back into our normal whatever that may mean format. Awesome. Talk to you soon, Raz. All right. Bye, Raz. I used to wear a lot of rings. I could see that for you. <laughs> like, r- I like think ring that guy. That's an Raz, insult. why are you not a ring guy? I think Raz I think was a ring guy as that's well. A... <laughs> no, because I played drums. So, so what? I played bass. Yeah, no, but holding the stick with rings was it would start to to dig into my thing. Yeah. I have noticed that the calluses on my left hand are sort of shaping themselves around around the ring. The ring. Yeah, uh, that. I mean, look at your hand in twenty years. Look at my hands today. They don't look they don't look good. <laughs> Let's remind him in twenty years to look at his hands. Yeah. Bill, have you seen this? Have you seen your own hands lately? <laughs> they like, look shit, yeah. Bill. I know they really like I have chronically dry hands, so they're always like <laughs> splitting open and bleeding. And I you know, I paint for what a are living. Are you allergic to moisturizer? Um, white people don't wear moisturizer. I yes, think is... they do. Everyone does. Everyone does. Everyone should. Conversely, I have the hands of an Austrian prince. They are quite gorgeous. <laughs> they are immaculately manicured, and they look decades younger than they, they actually that. are. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was fishing for that. Thank you. <laughs> Your hands look younger than you are. You know? You know, at my age, you try to get what you can. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Got blessed with good hands. Yeah, you know? Yeah, yeah, that goes a long way. Yeah, I, I lead with that at bars. You know, I, I talk with my hands and, you know, I just kind of put them. Right. You lead with and you're not them. looking at anyone with your face. No. No, no, no I no. like stare at the ceiling. Like. Yeah, yeah. You're actually turned in the opposite direction, but just feeling with your hands. Yeah, totally. You know? Yeah, just getting a vibe with your hands. Yeah, that's, that's why my batting average is like. <laughs> Zero. <laughs> yeah. I got referred to as black hoodie guy the other night. What does that mean? Uh, For I was, somebody as pale and red faced as you to get referred to as black anything, just I count know. it as a blessing. No, because I have a black hoodie, right? And I'm I'm perpetually cold and sleepy. Oh. Yeah. Right. Poor Raz. Poor me. I, like I had the heater going. This was like a sauna before you walked in. So, but I had like a black hoodie, and everywhere I go. 
you know, I just kind of throw my black hoodie. And so the other night I was, I was out and I was with a friend and she, she came back to me and she's like, Oh, Hey, you know, you're officially black hoodie guy now. Right. It's like, what? She's like, yeah, I'm here with my buddy Raz. And the guy goes, Oh, black hoodie guy. (laughs) So it's really not helpful. Yeah. You've been outside. I mean, if there's like a stiff breeze in Los Angeles, everybody's in like their parkas. And how many of them are black hoodies? Yeah. A lot. Many. Yeah. Most. Probably. Probably. But that's, you know, but that was the, the thing. I guess I was wearing it a lot. That's why yeah. I have like a new shirt on. It looks pretty sharp. So, by the so way. I, I think we're all from the East Coast. Do you think that you have become soft? Since you've moved to LA, because I feel so like soft. I am just made of plush. I'm just nothing. <laughs> I have no skin, even. I'm just a permeable membrane in the cold. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, dude. I was I was soft in in New. You England. were soft to begin oh, with. Yeah, no. That's like, why you came out here. Yeah. Uh huh. No, yeah. I came out here to get continentally as far away as I could from uh-huh. my family. Like I, I just ran out of land. Yo, if land like considered, <laughs> like if it continued to like Hawaii, I would be like, all right. But I just you there's know. always Alaska rest. <laughs> so, but yeah, no, I'm I'm totally soft. Yeah, I mean, you either come to LA because you're soft, or you're soft because you're from LA. All right. Speaking uh, of that, why did you come to LA? Um, I came to LA. Uh, almost three years ago now, coming up on my three-year anniversary. Um, and I came As out here... As they say in Scarface. Tres años! <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry. And um, I came out right after I graduated from undergrad in Colorado, and I took a train from New they Mexico. they pronounce it Colorado. It's Colorado. It's Colorado. It's a very peaky A. Yeah, peaky A. For sure, yeah. It's it's on brand. It's on brand. Um, but anyway, I took a train out from New Mexico to California, and um, uh, I'm a painter. I'm a visual artist, so I was kind of deciding between New York or L.A., and um, as I mentioned, I'm from Connecticut, from the East Coast, and I grew up pretty close to New York, so felt like I... Honestly, I felt like if I went there right away, I probably would never leave, so... My to the in, city, yeah. To the you call it the city too. <laughs> to What's the city, respecting Easterner doesn't. <laughs> By the way, for all of our listeners based in the West Coast, that would be New York City. That is New York City, the city. Cape Cod is the Cape. <laughs> the city is New York. So, were you on the train when you decided this? Did you like come to a fork of the road where had like <laughs> two signs, it's like New York? No, LA. I definitely bought the train ticket in advance. But um, what really was the deciding factor was that I had um, an internship that was unpaid. I was just kind of cold calling uh, print shops, traditional print shops um, in Los Angeles, seeing if I could get a bite. And then I was lucky enough to be hired uh, just via email through. Um, this wonderful artist, Camilla Taylor, and she was working at Josephine Press, and I was printing there with John Greco and uh, Camilla Taylor. And I was teaching etching workshops and monoprint and uh, kind of traditional fine art printmaking stuff. And I was printing for other artists and um, all that kind of good stuff. So I was doing that for a while. Um, I actually was working three jobs when I first moved here. I was working there. Uh, at a fitness studio and also at a burger place, which was... Those two uh, things sound like they cancel each other. They out. kind of do. And then the internship was unpaid, so I think it all amounted to nothing. <laughs> <laughs> no, no anyway. it's not nothing. Life in Los Angeles, <laughs> folks. <laughs> it's, it's equality, and that's what, that's what Los Angeles is. Right. I, so I was at... I was in Studio City, right? Studio City yesterday. Yeah. Uh, buying my... I'm going to pimp my new shirt and it's nice it's yeah an audio great podcast, shirt yeah i like that more yeah, but yeah the more is nice right mm-hmm. it makes your eyes kind of like sparkle it does thank you <laughs> again looking for these compliments but there was a weight watchers and right next to it was a a, a waffle place <laughs> like right next door and i'm thinking who I mean, only in L.A., right? I don't think that's unique to L.A. I think we probably see that dichotomy exist side by side more often. But I think that's like the American way is like 
eat as much as you can, consume all you can, and then like spend all your money trying to get rid of it. Oh, it's like my first marriage. Right, yeah. <laughs> In what way? <laughs> she got it. See, we're, we're having a little bourbon together, all so right, she understands. Well, <laughs> let me see if my, my non-alcoholic beer can get me onto this page as well. <laughs> what is this show called again? Oh, this thing I'm sitting on. Yeah. Green couch. On the green couch. Green long chair. Yeah. <laughs> it's called <laughs> On the Long Green Chair. <laughs> Green Shea Lounge. <laughs> Welcome to On the Green Ottoman. Yeah, right, totally. I'm Bob Zoon. Yeah, right, totally. that, that's when we start like branching out to... This is the alternate universe. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Brinka Pearson. <laughs> and <No>. Ruse. <laughs> Re- Ruse Wuldoon. Oh, there we go. It's nice to have you back, Bill, by the way. Yeah, thank you very much. I was totally lost without you. I don't know. I was spiraling. I was <laughs> you heard like... the last one. I know. You were starting to get kind of angry on the mic there. You <laughs> yeah. lost your moorings, my uh, friend. I, I did. Yeah, no, that's what happens when you sit in this room alone, uh, <laughs> you know, 24 hours a day. Right. I never leave. So. Mm. But anyway. At least it's a nice room. It is a nice room. Yeah, these guitars you have are beautiful. Thank you. That's Bill's artwork on the wall, by the way. It's very nice. I already knew Bill was a good painter, though, so. I always say that you're a painter until you die, and then you're an artist. Ah. Uh, Sad. That's kind of sweet. It is, right? Yeah, that's kind of nice. It's, Why? Uh, <laughs> that's like the most nihilistic approach to art making. I mean, I think... It's the least self-serious, I think it deeply is. deeply pessimistic. Like, all right, like Van Gogh, he's the guy that cut off his ear, right? No, he cut off his eyebrow. Really? No. His ear. His ear. Yeah. Right. yeah. We all know that. Yeah. He made no money as a as an artist. He made no money. It was after he died where he started making money. <sighs> it's like well, Sabrina's made lots of money, I right, Sabrina? I <laughs> have uh, not made that much money. I can't say that. <laughs> so uh, things are going great. <laughs> <laughs> well, things are awesome. Okay, no, Still like, working at that burger place. <laughs> no, no, thank God. <laughs> and that's one thing. I, like I want to talk to you and and Bill as well because you're both artists. There is like a, a really good art scene in LA that kind of popped up um, in like the, I guess the late 2000s, right? Now or... I would say specifically in terms of painting, it's a really uh, nutritious breeding ground for that kind of work being made right now. And um, like a lot of the galleries on the east side that I frequent, I'm just always really impressed, particularly by the paintings that are coming out of LA. And I think it sort of started with... Um, I mean, there's the whole, like, people who have come out of CalArts, like Mark Bradford, um, et cetera, and he has a big practice and huge following, and he uh, exhibited at the Venice Biennale a few years ago. And, you know, he is definitely, like, a pronounced voice, and I think in a lot of ways, ways has paved the way for other painters in L.A. He did his BFA and his MFA at CalArts. Yeah, and then there are a lot of other, like, experimental painters as well, like... Um, Mary Weatherford comes to mind. She does these kind of, I kind of think of them as Helen Frankenthaler's with neon. They're just these big, she uses flash paint, um, which can be diluted into this nice uh, kind of opaque, um, but just really pretty type of vinyl-based acrylic paint. And she does these big washes over these huge canvases and then has these pieces of neon that go through it. Mm -hmm. And you can... I mean, like the chords and the electronics are are explicitly displayed as well, but it's this kind of cool juxtaposition of like hard neon light against these sort of translucent washes against canvas, which are really nice. And they're they're kind of environmental. They're big, um, you know, probably ten feet tall or something like that. Sounds almost like a description of Los Angeles itself. Yeah. <laughs> they're like, ah, oh, it's five o'clock. Let me look up at the mountains behind the city. Right. You get these nice big purple vistas and then this like mechanical neon spike shooting up out of the middle of yep. it. Yep. Or that little cross, that neon cross. That... Oh, the one in Hollywood. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I was working underneath that today. <laughs> Goddamn cross. <laughs> We're all working underneath the cross, Bill. Mm-hmm. Spirit in the sky. <laughs> <laughs> so do you gallery hop like, you know, like people like bar hop or... Uh, yeah, I mean, I try to as much as I can. Um, you guys probably know that last 
you know, last weekend and the weekend before and the whole week in between was the Freeze, LA Freeze, which is this uh, big contemporary exhibit. It's kind of like a trade show for art and people are just, people, galleries from all over the world and the country have their own booths at this Freeze event and um, they're representing the galleries, or sorry, they're representing the artists who are on their rosters. So they have like, kind of representational works of the artists that they're showing and it's just like you walk through and there's just a fuck ton of art to look at and uh, it's meant to kind of propel sales and fairs have definitely become a well-attended thing that happened um, in LA which didn't used to always be the case. It's always been that way in uh, like New York and Miami especially but yeah kind of newer to LA which is pretty cool and exciting for the artists who are local. The fairs are? Yeah. Are you, are you speaking of the uh, the sorts of craft fairs or? They are not craft fairs. Um, and just to distinguish uh, craft, I'm thinking of like textiles, woven pieces, um, maybe things that could be purchased as gifts, jewelry, those kinds of things. Um, and at these fairs, it's pretty much what you would call quote unquote fine art. So it's Painting, sculpture, um, but mostly 2D work. Mm. Yeah. I have a, um, I, I, functionally speaking, she's like my sister-in-law, but technically I guess she's my uh, my wife's cousin. Mm -hmm. um, but she she's a sculptor. That's Allison Iwamoto Ceramics, by the way. Um, and I see all these, I'm, I'm usually helping her set up her shows when mm -hmm. they're in the city. Mm -hmm. And so I'm seeing these kinds of cross sections of she she does produce jewelry as well, but she also has things that are less utilitarian or at least like less applicable aesthetic items. You know, they're little sculptures, you know, thing like uh you know, melon sized items. And um there seem to be a lot of ceramics at these kind of like craft fairs. But um, so that's fun. that's interesting because I wouldn't have assumed that there were fairs in the city um, that are strictly art oriented. Because maybe, and this is just you know my myopia, but I'm you know uh, I'm in a zone where I'm seeing like oh Allison, she's an artist. She's at the thing. Next to her is the guy who's got like the super coffee beans, and the on the one on the other side is like, oh, we make all of our handbags out of recycled cats. It's like, you know, there's, and all of those three things are just kind of like in the market, and they call it market xenon or whatever. And yeah. You, you know, you pay too much to be there, and you make, you know, enough. Uh, maybe, I have done some of those before actually this little tattoo i got at one of those fairs that i did i paid is that a die on it's just arm? a little die that doesn't even have the third side filled in with dots <laughs> but <laughs> i got it for twenty dollars at this highland park art fair that i paid 35 dollars for a table and i didn't even break even i did uh, not even break even with what i was day. selling yeah it was it was kind of tough out there <laughs> well it is tough as an artist because art is subjective you know yeah and you know, there, there, like I went to there. There was the, uh, what is it, the mercantile thing at, was it Mocha or Lacma that had like the weaving and mercantile show? Oh, that's uh, cool. Uh, I don't know about that one. Yeah, so it was just it was all the it was just weaves and and different mm -hmm. wallpapers and the art of wallpaper and, I, like I, completely didn't get why, you know, anybody would even buy some of that stuff. I mean, there were people like crying. They're looking at this like weave and I'm like, ah. <laughs> I mean, I you think, know? I think there is so much. One of my best friends, Susie McMurtry is a really amazing textile artist. And you know, the kind of care and love and forethought that goes into that practice is something that I deeply respect. And I think is so cool. I mean, there's, so much that goes into creating a dye and finding the right kind of colors for the yarn and you could even spin the yarn yourself and setting it up on a loom is oh my god like such an ordeal okay so that that brings me to is the process the art or is the result 
the art? That's a good question. I mean, I haven't done much weaving myself, but it seems like it would be so uh, meditative, but also like excruciating over time because it's just so slow going and um, it's very physical and it, it takes a lot of um, concerted effort to notice what kind of things are happening. Like if you have any mistakes or anything like that, it could just mess up the whole piece. And, you know, so. Right. Sounds no, like accounting. It, I think it kind of, it's very mathematical. It's, I mean, that's a perfect metaphor. It's, it's a super logical practice that takes um, a lot of attention to detail. But in itself, like that, all that setup and having that knowledge, and I don't, I don't, I don't know where I'm going here with this, but I'm just kind of talking because I do that. But my point is like, when does it become, like when does something become art? When you put a frame around it. <laughs> right. Well, I think one thing that you're alluding to there is uh, talking about the kind of knowledge that goes into these practices. And um, I think what's happening there is having a dialogue with tradition. And I think art happens uh, when two things occur. One is when you are creating something that exists in dialogue with other pieces of works, other kinds of schools of thought that have existed before. Um, you know, having an awareness for that, having studied those things and, um, and maybe not even referencing them, but knowing that I think informs the work. And that's, you know, so when you're speaking to the tradition that exists, I think there's power in that. And I think that's what makes something art. And then the second thing is when, um, in my mind, I think the second thing that makes something art is when you are a physical maker, it's uh, filling the space between the idea that you have, the vision that you have, and its execution, the technical execution. So I could have a really, really great idea, but if I haven't been practicing drawing or photography or whatever my medium is, and I can't really execute that, it shows, you know, and I think success in art specifically is what happens when you fill the space between those two things. So that would be a definition you're purporting or proposing of successful art. Yeah, I think to to be more clear, yeah. And in that, what kind of art do you yourself practice for our listeners? Please say Wiccan. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> The art of the deal. <laughs> the art of the deal. Oh my God! I wish I'd probably in, be in a better position if that were my trade. Well, then you wouldn't be an artist. <laughs> That's true. A they're they're artist. mutually exclusive. Right. No. no I, we'll, and we'll talk about art versus commerce because at some point, you know, because art. But let's get to Bill's question first. Go ahead. Okay. Well, you asked it, right? Did I? I think I heard it. Yeah. What kind of art do you practice, Sabrina? Um, I would consider myself a painter. I would consider myself a painter. I work primarily with oil. And uh, recently, about a year or two ago, I introduced flash paint into my practice. And that, you said that that was like an acrylic thing? It's, yeah. it's a vinyl-based paint. So it operates the same way that acrylic does. Um, its solvent is water. Mm -hmm. uh, with oil paint, you're using mineral spirits or turpentine or something like that to dilute the pigment. Um, and for uh, people who might not know this, acrylic paint, that's plastic-based. So it, it ends up, you know drying pretty flat and opaque or i guess no no more like a it has like a shine to it like it, it's got more of a it depends a on gloss. the gloss yeah it depends i'd say that's that's for the majority true um it is kind of shiny uh it dries quickly and that's the biggest difference between oil and acrylic is the fat so the fat in acrylic paint is plastic the fat in flash paint is vinyl and the fat in oil paint is oil and um, the flash paint, does it, I mean, do you, so you said you paint with oil and flash? Yes. So. Do they have a similar sort of resistance to one another in the correct. way that acrylic and oil would? Yes. I know that in my, you know, in my experiences, I would att occasionally attempt to paint one over the other and realize that they're, they're separating and it's creating all these weird shitty cracks. And before mm -hmm. I 
before I understood that that was something to be expected, it was it was disappointing. But once you figure out that that's going to happen, you can use it as sort of an asset. Mm-hmm. In the there's this thing uh, Brian Eno talks about in music um, called generative music, where it's almost more like you just kind of put some components into, for lack of a better term, like a an algorithm, mm-hmm. you know, or like a process, a formula, and it kind of you know just by the function of the formula, it spits things out, and so. You know, that would be the case in, you can't control how these cracks are going to form in your paints, but you know that it's going to make cracks of one sort or another. Is that something you employ when you're, when you're working on your stuff or does your art have a more, um, linear, is it, is it pictures of stuff (laughs) or is it, is it a bunch of shapes and colors? The go. ladder, <laughs> the ladder, the ladder, the ladder. It's a bunch of shapes and colors. Um, but to answer your first question, um, I do not employ that that particular technique in my work. There's definitely a linear progress for each of the pieces. So I'll start with flash paint because, as Bill mentioned, you know the relationship between oil and water is is a non relationship. So you have to begin with um, whatever that plastic is first, that can be your grounds. Um, You would prime any oil painting with a layer of acrylic or 12 layers of of acrylic or whatever it it is you use um, to prime your canvas. So this is not replacing that, but it's just kind of like another layer of that. So in my work recently, I've been using the flash paint, which as I was talking about a little bit earlier, Um, If it's not diluted with water, it has this really beautiful, silky, matte, opaque texture. So you can really work with it in this this way that doesn't really divulge your hand. So you can work with it and it creates this really perfect surface. And by that you mean there's a limited amount of brush strokes visible? Like almost none. Almost none unless it's diluted. So um, that gives you a lot of freedom. It's super forgiving. If you're trying to create a ground, um, that can be really nice. And so what I've done in my work recently is try to create these sort of fields of color or larger shapes of color. And those act as a kind of starting point for building the the composition. And um, for listeners, I create abstract work so they are mostly shapes I think a lot of my influences include um, like Matisse and uh, you know his shape and color are so phenomenal and I look to those forever so soft shapes. soft yeah soft organic shapes not hard not angular not mm. not a uh, splatty not splatty um, more solid That's than a that word they taught me at the Museum of Fine Arts <laughs> Not. (laughs) There's like so much to go there. Uh, I'll just let it live in my head. (laughs) Actually, something that I look to a lot is geology. And one thing that I really appreciate in looking at geology is that it's sort of the perfect intersection of organic shapes and hardline geometry. So what's really cool about looking at rocks, um, I studied geology a little bit in school, but I didn't fail chemistry, but I didn't pass either. So that was kind of off the table (laughs) pretty quickly. (laughs) Um, But I really enjoyed it, if nothing else, just for the kind of aesthetic information that I was gathering. Um, And that's still definitely a a large part of my practice. Um, But what I really appreciate in rocks is that there's there's the cleavage that happens, how they break um, is really traditionally geometrical. There are these hard line shapes that occur, um, just kind of like infinite number of sides, polygons. Um, And inconsistent patterns, or or rather, I should say, not that they are in a consistent pattern. No, fuck, that could still be misconstrued. Uh, They are consistently patterned. There we go. Yeah, yes, they are consistently patterned, for sure. But when you look at the kind of 
you know, if you squint your eyes a little bit and you look at this thing for what it is at a high level, it's this really beautiful organic shape that's happened um, through all these millions of years long geological processes, natural processes that interact with all the different elements of nature. And so that's sounds cheesy, but it's something that I really, really no, enjoy. That's, I, to me, that's the basis of art mm-hmm. is is like an interpretation of, of, of nature, of something natural. People look at the sunset and they're like, I need to paint something. I mean... You just happen to look at rocks and go, I need to paint something. But it's the same thing, you know, and, and music is the same. It kind of, because I'm thinking of uh, Bartok, mm-hmm. you know. We, uh, we interviewed a modular synthesist who took a lot of inspiration on a recent release of his from uh, geological geometry. Oh, minerals. that's so, that's amazing. Right. The benefit of working from art that, Raz, all right. How, what do you think is the impetus for when somebody writes a song? Uh, I think it's an, well, the impetus is actually an, an emotion. Exactly. Yes. About. Oh, I got it right. About. I'll, I'll drink to that. Nice. About <laughs> what? Like usually themselves though, right? right? Yeah, right. About them. Yeah. It's like a personal thing. Like right, nine anywhere. out of 10 songs, people are saying like, oh, woe is me. Right. No, I'm not looking at a rock going, you know what? This rock is inspiring me to write this kick ass riff how many songs like that can a person make over their lifetime how many <laughs> like, let me rephrase like that. fucking how many, bangers <laughs> how many songs like that should a person make over their lifetime uh i would say none i was trying to work in the outfield because i was listening to our first our first episode i was trying to work in an outfield reference there but um i would say none this is the thing they said about jackson pollock was that if he had lived he probably would have started to have made very shitty paintings because all of, or what, no, excuse, or was it Basquiat? Either way, actually, you know what? The same for same. both of them because they were painting from this sort of like internal place sure. rather than an external place, like as their mode of input. And within yourself, there's only so much as opposed to the world where it's like every day is a new sunset. Yes. Even if your whole thing is, you know what I do? I do fucking uh, Bob Ross. I do, who's the guy? Oh, Thomas Kincaid. Like I do Thomas Mm -hmm. Kincaid versions of that sunset. Even if you only paint the sunset, like every day is a new sunset. Yeah. Every day is a new sunset. It'll change. And you can... There's, that's wonderful. I think that it's wonderful that you don't, Sabrina, I'm gesturing at now, listeners, that you don't paint from this sort of like interior combat. I, I'd say that it's... Um... Or that you don't draw exclusively from it as so many artists in the music realm do. You know, that's something that I realized like pretty early on in my you know, more serious painting practice, if you'd even con- call it that. Because I was at first, and I, to me, I was making some of my better work, and so it's kind of taken a minute to appreciate that work for what it is. But realizing that that kind of practice is unsustainable, to be constantly mining yourself for emotional inspiration is uh, is exhausting, mm-hmm. and it's often not that good. Unless it's authentic. Yeah. Mine's just a giant canvas of black. <laughs> <laughs> I would expect nothing less, for us. <laughs> no, in my head. I mean, look, I respect you guys because you're both artists. And like, I, to me, like being able to look at something and have it inspire you to, to create something like beautiful from that. That, that to me, that's like, I, I don't even know how you, it's. I, I think for me, actually what it is, um, and I try to abide by this I, as best I can. Um, I think it was Chuck Close who said it or someone else of that caliber or whatever. SMFA grad. <laughs> is he? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but anyhow, that uh, work begets work, you know. So when you're working constantly, that's kind of when inspiration strikes. Yeah, and the engine's already running. Exactly. So I feel like I get to those kind of juicy bits, those those learnings when I'm actually just 
creating and working as much as I can and just kind of maintaining a practice is what helps me maintain a practice and create more work that I feel good about. You got to go to the office. You got to, you got to like, yeah. ch- you got to punch in and you gotta punch like, in. work. So do you look at your old work and think, ah, like, you know, I just picture mm-hmm. you having like a, like, a, you know, like every artist lives in a loft, right? And it's always, there's always like soft light coming in and you have just like, you know. I do live in a loft. <laughs> <laughs> See, there we go. Hey, my fantasy. This is great. And there's just like, what are they called? Canvases. Stretched canvas. Canvases. And they're just like up against the wall collecting dust and you're like, ah. They are doing that. They are doing that. And that is not an exaggeration. Um, it's very dusty in my loft. <laughs> um, but no, I, I really appreciate the work that I was doing, um, you know, a few years ago. And I see that for what it is and what that meant for my practice as a whole. Um, it's actually the kind of stuff that I've made since then, it's kind of like, I guess, what it would be like to, like the first time you get high or something like that. Like it feels really, really good and you're trying to grasp that feeling again or or feel something close to it. And I think that's, in a non-addictive way, that's kind of what happens in art, for me anyway, is that there are some things, it's actually when I feel like I didn't even make them. Like when I look at something and I think objectively like, hey, that's pretty good. That's when I feel like really happy and mm. maybe even proud of a work. Um, but it's like, it kind of ebbs and flows. It's not like shit, 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 uh, you know, going upward with my hand, shit, shit, shit. And then it's like getting better. It's like this constant ebb and flow of having an idea, doubting the idea, trying the idea, the idea coming out badly. And then trying again, learning something that you might not even apply to that work, but maybe will occur in something else that you're thinking about too. So, I mean, for me, it's kind of about um, trying to find the connections between all of these sort of themes that are floating around in my own cosmos and things that I'm interested in and, and trying to connect those with some sort of structure. And I think I'm just trying to do that through my painting right and that was my follow-up and i think you kind of answered that is like i know as a musician i'll write a song and then i'll just it goes into my untitled logic folder and then you know i'll be cleaning out my hard drive and be like oh what's this it'll be like bass thing in e and at the time i was like it's like you're smoking pot like oh this is fucking great but then you come down you're like oh this is terrible whatever and, and just kind of it gets pushed into that where your canvases are just kind of stacking up and piling dust and then sometimes i go back and i go you know what i can actually work this up into something do you do that as an artist where you kind of look at your your dusty canvases and completely completely i'd I'd say that i um i also try to stay in a student's mind when i'm working um i don't always have the premonition that this is going to be the best piece I ever make and usually I have no expectations I often start with some semblance of an idea or a composition that I think will be interesting or a palette that I want to pursue and then um, it inevitably takes a completely different shape but I feel like I find the most success when I at least learn something so even if the piece as a whole and whether it's a study or like a bigger more serious piece even if the piece as a whole doesn't really turn out in an objectively good way, more often than not, something that I've learned that I will try to employ later on. Right. So the baseline's good. The rest of it's shit. Exactly. And there's merit to that. Yeah, there is. So I want to go to one of Bill's questions from our very first episode. Where is the good art? I saw this. On your podcast yes. page. Yes. Okay, where is the good art? I mean, is this question like in Los Angeles or is it like a conceptual question or within yourself or within the world? Here, let me let me reframe that for this because that's taking it a little bit out of context. Okay. All right. So when when last we asked this. It was in reference to Shepard Fairey specifically mm-hmm. in how he 
created um, this work that was um, purporting to be uh, subversive and he turned that fame into a big company thereby some might suggest becoming the thing that he was attempting to draw attention to and subvert Mm. like basically he went from like like printing obey stickers you know kind of mocking the concept of brand fealty and now obey is a brand and you can buy like obey t-shirts so it's like it's is it the snake eating its own tail? But mm-hmm. I don't know that that's necessarily applicable to you because it's, except unless, and this brings me to, let me say this, what's your art about? Mm-hmm. Oh, man, I wish that my work were a little more commercial friendly in that way. Like I wish that, you know, I'm glad that it exists within this kind of realm um, that I've created you know, but it's it's hard to extract anything from that and have it mean anything on a T-shirt. You know, if I were to just like grab one of these shapes that exists and, you know, has meaning and is part of my painter's vocabulary, but to put that on a, on a T-shirt or any kind of branded content just feels like, you know, it just feels like a shape on a T-shirt with nothing around it, no context. You, all right, so you're, you're taking in a lot of, external references be they natural be they internal uh you know geology geometry other artists work and you're putting them through the sabs blender and spitting out a smoothie of your paintings and this is something i struggle with with my own paintings Mm -hmm. so now where's the good art but why the art okay like yeah. what is it what is it that when you make a painting and you are in dialogue you know what is it that you're saying in that conversation mm-hmm. Okay so um I've been writing about this a bit lately and in addition to kind of the geology and geometry that I'm thinking about in my work Um, I'm also kind of considering technology specifically in software development since I'm sort of living in that world and how it faces um, design elements. So I'm thinking about technology or I'm also thinking about ancient Greek language which is what I also studied in, in undergrad. And the why for me is about translation which you actually referred to earlier in that really excited me because, um, you know, the, the way that I find that sort of connective tissue between all of these ideas that don't on a surface level feel related is translating them. So in my work, I'm sort of thinking about the high level ideas that something can contain and thinking about containers for that in abstract work. And the only way that I really know how to do that right now is is through abstract painting. So yeah. each, of, each of these shapes can kind of act as a representative for, um, you know, like the meanings that occur simultaneously in a word. And, you know, I, I'm thinking about kind of how things can exist with multiple meanings and, and interact with each other. You know, there's something that hasn't come up lately. I was browsing Instagram today as as one does as a millennial does and this band that I'm a big fan of posted you know like hey we're um we're moving forward without this founding member because it turns out that he's you know not held up his end of the uh social contract right in regards to his treatment of others Mm. and um that you know basically to in a succinct format, it's just like, has Me Too hit the visual arts outside of filmmaking? You know, it's um, it's timely that you ask that, of course, since this is sort of the pulse of everything that's going on in, in the environment in which we live in L.A. 
But um, I was recently applying to graduate school for an MFA, and I reached out to a former professor of mine who, um, you know, taught me everything. You know, he he was maybe one degree removed from reality at times, but he did especially in a formal way, like taught me pretty much everything I know about abstract composition and uh, like formal relationships and density and line weight and all these kinds of formal elements that, um, you know, are, are big players in, in my own work. And uh, he wrote one of my letters of recommendation and it wasn't until after that I found out that he had actually been let go and he'd been at my school for like 30 years something like that and maybe I assume even longer this was under the the pretense of him having abused somebody I you know the details haven't been fully disclosed but I know that from what I've read uh there, yeah, it was probably... There was an accusation. Yeah, there I think, multiple accusations of um, homophobia, uh, kind of sexual misconduct, and perhaps sexual assault. And, and you know, that was, um, that was kind of troubling to hear, of course, since I had a closer relationship with him. But it also wasn't that surprising. And it made gave me pause, for sure, because I was thinking about, like, how to respond in a way that feels authentic to me and, and my beliefs and what I stand for and, uh, you know, in a way that still honors what I learned from him and, and the relationship that we had as, as mentor and mentee. If this professor of yours or this teacher or whatever, this, this associate was, you know, a competent artist, well, don't, you know, I'll still watch Arrested Development post Jeffrey Tambor being outed for being abusive because I want to support Jessica Walters. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think it gets it gets trickier, and uh, you know when it's an innately collaborative product like a TV show. Yeah, you know when you're looking at a single artist's work. I mean, like I'm not gonna. Nobody is supporting this guy by supporting your painting. Right. But right, the, yeah, the same yeah, no, cannot no. be said about a band exactly. or a, an ensemble cast right. or a, right. you know, something that has right. some people who are dirtbags and others who are not. Mm -hmm. In fact, they are um, they're protesting because they are supporting what I've learned, what I've garnered, what I've gathered from that relationship. So in turn, I think that they are... Your, your supportive audience is yeah. protesting this person. You're yeah. saying by... by virtue of their action of supporting you. Right. Interesting. That's a that's a wonderful concept. Um, for those who want to support you, do you have any shows coming up? Are you actively displaying anywhere? I am not actively exhibiting, but I have a show that is to be announced very soon. Um, I can't give away details yet because it's a new gallery. Um, so is it going to be in the city? It's in Los Angeles? It's though? in Los Angeles. It'll be in Culver City probably at the end of March. We'll follow up on a future episode once those details get re revealed sure. that we'll be able to announce that. Yes, absolutely. No, Nowhere else though? I have a critique group that I meet with once a month, but in terms of exhibitions, it's been... And you have... Oh, so you're part of a critique group. I mean, that sounds mm -hmm. like you... My goal is not to be critical. My goal is to ask genuine questions, you know, things that I am, am authentically perplexed by or something that really interests me or something that I'm really enjoying. So um, I just try to talk about things that feel real and feel like they are beneficial to the person making them, you know. I'm not out there to just tell you your work looks like shit, but if it does, I might ask a question about why. Why does your art look like <laughs> shit? <laughs> Thank you, Sabrina. <laughs> so if somebody wanted to determine whether or not your work looked like shit, is there a website that they could go to to judge? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. My website is www.sabrinapearsall.com. And Pearsall is spelled P-I-E-R-S-O-L. And you're also on Instagram? I'm also on Instagram. And my handle is at 
Sapsel, S A B P S L. That's me. Sapsel. Sapsel. It's just been my thing forever. That's a good. It sounds like some sort of like a multinational conglomerate. <laughs> We're Sapsel. We sell soap and tires <laughs> and baby formula. <laughs> well, Sabrina from Raz and I, let me say thank you very so much for coming in on the green couch. We always love, despite the audio format, getting to speak with visual artists, uh, especially those as well versed in their craft as you are. Oh, thank you so much. And uh, with that, goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> On the Green Couch is a production of Art School Records in conjunction with and recorded at Project 4 Studios in Burbank, California. The show is edited by Raz, with additional production support by Dixie Trussell. Please remember to subscribe, rate, and review us in Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. It all goes to helping other people find us. For more information, please visit our forever home on the web at artschoolrecords.com. I'm Bill Zunkin, and thanks for listening.